Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. All right, let's do that. Take a minute. Think about what you were when you were called, when God called you, when Jesus called you and saved you. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. None of us were all that. But God. But God chose the foolish things. The foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. None of us that are going to stand before the Lord and do anything for God are going to be able to say, look what I did. Look what I've accomplished. Nebuchadnezzar tried that. Didn't work out so good for him. Here he was king of all the world at the time. Had it all. And it went to his head. Look at me. Look what I, Nebuchadnezzar, has done. And he became like a wild man. His nails grew long. His hair grew out. He was down on all fours, eating out of the ground. But God restored him because he humbled himself. It is because of him, him being God, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Everything we have, everything we are, It's all wrapped up in Him. He's our righteousness. That means our right standing before God is because of Him. He makes us holy. That has to do with removing our sin from us and redeems us, saves us from hell and the pit to be in glory one day. It's all Him. Anybody seen or anything in there about you or me or I? No. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. My title this morning is Boasting in the Lord. Excuse me. I got a head cold. I'm getting this thing running and it ain't going to stop. It's amazing how much we can keep up in there. Where does it all come from? I don't know. It just runs and runs. The scripture reminds us of who and what we are. We're not the wise, we're not the influential, not of noble birth. Rather, rather we are those who are foolish, weak, lowly, and despised. Are there some who are Christians who who, um, maybe are smarter than the average person or have more money? Yes, there are. Scripture says it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, so it is tougher to be rich and have a lot and, and enter the kingdom of God because it does take you away from the Lord. You get so fixated on the riches and what have you. Most of us, I would dare say, who are part of the church of Jesus Christ are, are those that are foolish and weak and lowly and despised. The world will look at us and say, they're nothing special. They're not very smart. Matter of fact, they're kind of foolish. God's revelation to me when I was feeling terrible about myself was this. It's never been about you, John. It's about me, my plan for you. I love you and will use you. We sang that song, Oh, How He Loves Us. Oh, How He Loves Us. So true. I love you. I will use you. Just stay Submitted to me. Confess your sins, your faults. 
keep, keep those things under the blood, but you know what? Nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop us. And by that, I mean God and I. You and God. What can stop you? The devil? No. Nah. Defeated foe. He only has the power that we give him. So if we don't give him any power, we stay focused on the Lord. There's nothing that can stop us. He loves us. He saves us. And he uses us as we are, but he cares so much for us not to let us remain the same. We come to him as we are, the mess that we are, the imperfected being that we are, all our faults, all our sins. He cleanses us from our sin and says, okay, as we do this journey together, the big long term we use is sanctification. As we progress in our sanctification, in other words, becoming more and more like Jesus, he continues to use us, who we are, while at the same time perfecting us. He's, he's the ultimate multitasker. We're not very good at it, but God's great at it. So he's, he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere at once. He can do that, you know. We, we're not so good at it. He says, I'm going to take you where you are, but I'm not going to let you stay there. I'm going to continue to work in your life, perfect you. He did not choose us. He did not choose me because I'm all that. You know, the phrase, I'm all that in a bag of chips, you know. You know, we're not all that. And I don't care who it is and what kind of reputation they have. You know, there's the big names in ministry, the Billy Grahams and the um, Oral Roberts, you know, when I was a kid, uh, Benny Hinn nowadays, I guess, uh, Ron Parsley. Don't, it don't matter the big names in ministry. You know what? Apart from God, it just, just doesn't matter. It don't matter what your name is. Don't, it just doesn't matter. I want to give you a quick rundown of my testimony. I just felt like God wanted me to share it. And I, I'm, I'm not going to give you all the detail, but I'm going to want to share with you. you know, some of you are new to us. You don't know me yet fully. So I want you to know, kind of know who I am and what my background is. I was born and raised as somebody of God. I was a sixth child in my family, the youngest. Um, there was about nine years between me and the next youngest. So I grew up kind of like an only child. My my siblings were pretty much gone out of the house before I could really remember. Um, so I kind of had the benefits of a big family when we came back to the holidays and stuff, but, it, but then I was raised kind of like an only child. Um, my mom and dad, by the time I came along, were different people. My sister Sarah, Crystal's mom, would tell you s stories of people that I didn't know that raised her, that were her parents. They were not the parents that raised me. By the time I came along, it was a different they were different. My parents uh, loved Jesus. Uh, I was conceived when they had become, become Christians. I was, I was born when they were attending Geneva Assembly of God. They helped build that building that sits there on Preemption Road today. Um, my, my folks were simple people. My dad was a, a, a jack of all trades. Uh, I'm first generation ministry. There's, there hasn't been any other uh, pastors before us that I am aware of, anyway, that I know of. Um, my dad, wherever he could find work, that's kind of where we moved. We moved a lot, I guess, before me. They moved a lot. By the time I came along, we were a little more settled. My dad did everything from pumping gas. He was a baker in a bakery. He uh, was a sheriff at one point, county sheriff. The longest job that I believe that he had, he was, uh, for 13 years when I was a kid, he worked in a girl's school over in Lansing, New York, a state-run state girl's school. Now it's called the Lou Gossett Center in Lansing, if you're familiar with it. And it's, you know, it's, it's um, boys and girls now. Um, we lived in Dryden, New York when I was growing up when I was a kid. There was not an Assembly God church in Dryden at that point. There, later on, there became one. Uh, we used to travel from Dryden all over a place called uh, Aurora, New York. The church called Church in Poplar Ridge, New York. It doesn't exist anymore. They've sold the building. Little tiny country church where we actually had an outhouse. Still had an outhouse. 
which I didn't use very much, especially this time of year. It was um, pastored by a little old man. I mean, probably my, about my height. And he was old when I was a kid. He was old as dirt. He was a retired missionary. He was, they called him Sky Pilot Roby. He used to fly a single prop airplane in Africa. He'd go and he'd land in places where he could land it. And he'd preach to the natives. And eventually he just got too old to do that. He was a godly man, wonderful man. Then as I hit my teen years, my parents decided to go from there to Waterloo, New York, to Waterloo Assembly of God, which was going through revival, which back then we didn't know it was revival. We thought it was just church. But now we know that was revival. Because what was happening there was amazing. And that's where my teen years were spent. They built a new building while we were there, and God just did some incredible things. I, uh, it was there when at 16 and a half, I, I got serious with God. Um, when I was four at that little church in Poplar Ridge, an altar call was given one week. My mom turned to me and said, um, you want to go down and give your heart to Jesus? And I said, okay. So I went down with her and knelt at a piano stool. And I asked Jesus in my heart. And I remember it. How do you remember something when you're four? But I remember it. It's vivid in my mind. So God's hand was on me and I knew that. And then we started going to Waterloo. And uh, as a teenager, I got serious with God when I was 16 and a half. And I never, I never, never turned around, man. It was full bore. Okay, God, whatever you want for my life, I'll do. And God was, God was faithful to me. I went from being uninvolved to the church at all to being one of the youth leaders. I don't remember not being a youth leader. I got serious with God, and boom, I was a youth leader. And uh, we did some amazing stuff. God was poured out of his spirit in our youth group in ways that was just unbelievable. The whole church was in revival, and it was, it was a great, great time in my life. So that was a foundation for me. And for a couple of years, I kind of ran from God in terms of the call of ministry. I knew it. I've always knew it. I always knew it growing up. I knew God was calling me, and I kept saying, no, 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 no. And finally, I said, okay, all right, if I'm going to go, I'll go. My pastor had gone to Zion Bible Institute, so he kind of shared that with me a little bit. And so I considered that, and I decided I was going to go to Zion, which was a three-year school. They didn't give a degree yet. And then I'd go from there to Valley Forge and get my degree, which I did. In, be, in between there, though, I met Twyla at Zion. In our freshman year, we began to get to know each other. and It wasn't long. We, two and a half years. In, at Zion, at that time, you couldn't marry and stay. If you, had, if you got married, you had to leave. So we had to wait two and a half years to finish our school before we could, we could marry. That was a test. But after, after Zion was finished, we got married and went to, to Valley Forge together. And I could, t- I could tell you about the year of Valley Forge, but that's another whole message. That was a tough year. My dad, the same year we were married, had a severe heart attack. And it was just the grace of God he survived it all. And so after we finished Valley Forge, I had no clear direction from God to go anywhere. So we went back home. I actually lived in the same apartment house as my mom and dad. And so we helped take care of my dad uh, the last years of his life. He lived another six years, I believe, uh, six or seven years. Uh, but his health was rough, really rough. There are times I'd get up at two or three in the morning because he needed to go to the emergency room. And then I'd go to work shortly thereafter. So, uh, But I wouldn't change anything. There we had uh, our first two kids. We were in Waterloo. We uh, Shortly after we came back from Valley Forge, we started attending Geneva Assembly. We felt that's where God wanted us. And the pastor had been praying for someone to work with the youth. So I became his assistant there for eight years. Within a year or so, his wife was having babies. And she was leading worship, so they needed somebody to, to, to take it over. And, um, I told God, okay, I'd do that if you want me to. So we did that for, I don't know, six, seven years while we were there. Led worship and did the youth group. And I worked at, uh, most of that time in the Ames department store, worked up to management there. And then coming to, to Penyan was an interesting story, and I'm going to try and condense this down because it's a long story. Um, in 94, the end of 94, I quit working at Ames. And Twyla was working full time, and all I did was doing a little uh, substitute teaching here and there, which I wouldn't, worse, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. 
And she laughs. She knows. Yeah, the teacher knows. I said, never again, God. It was terrible. Anyway, uh, we were asked to, to come and fill in at, at Penyan. And Penyan, those remembered, was just downtown in the storefront. They had, at that point, six or eight people. And uh, they said, the pastor that's there, he's done. His last Sunday, his last Sunday in August, would you go and fill in? I said, oh, yeah, sure. I, mean, I was itching to go and preach, so I was excited about it. So we went, and uh, we met the people, and uh, they were asking us questions as we were introduced to them, and questions that had to do with, like, us moving there and whatever. And so I'm trying to answer the questions the best I could. And then the pastor who was there said, oh, we were told you're the new pastor. And I was like, uh, no. I was just asked to fill in. Anyway, long story short, he took us over to the parsonage, showed us the parsonage and everything. And he gave us the checkbook, the roll books, all the keys to the parsonage and to the storefront. And he drove away. My wife and I were standing on the lawn. And I looked at her and said, what just happened? <laughs> and we've been here almost 20 years ever since. And God has continued to do amazing things. You're sitting in one of them. I, I had no, no idea that this would ever happen. That we'd be sitting in this building and fellowshipping together. And there would be as many as you as there are. We started with six, eight people. Good people. Wonderful people. We've seen in the progress of this building process, just a mir miracles after miracle. Those who've been here, you know what I'm talking about. So that's just a little background of who I am. Here's what's always fascinating. My first place of ministry was the Geneva Summit of God where my parents got saved, where I was conceived. The first place we, we ever, what? Not in the church, Dave. <laughs> Go back to sleep. He wakes up for that. No, they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow that. <laughs> then uh, our first place we had a baptism service when I was pastor here was at Waterloo, some of the guy. We borrowed their tank one year, and that's where I was baptized when I was 18. So my life has been kind of full circle. God is, I told God you know, when we were leaving Geneva, I said, God, I'll, I'll, I'll go anywhere you want. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. <clears throat> well, my heart is really in the finger lakes. I would like to stay here, but I, I'll, I'll go wherever you want. <clears throat> well, we've been here 20 years. So, uh, I'm glad of that. Here's a thought I want to leave with you. I'm just about done. Our coming to God, our coming to a place of salvation and submitting to Him and saying, God, I want you in my life, was never about us doing God or somebody else a favor. <clears throat> it's never about that. I remember growing up, I always sat in the back, you know, as a kid, as a teenager, my teenage years especially. My mom and dad would sit up in front. And during the worship time, during the service, my mom would always... Be like, oh, you quit looking at me, all right? My mom was always like, what, you know, is God moving on his heart? Is God doing something? I, but I was stubborn enough, you know, I'm like, I ain't going to walk that aisle for anybody. I'm not going to do it just to make somebody else happy. Even though I love my parents, it has to be because it's God doing something. And so even if maybe there's a part of you that said, you know, I did it because I was pressured by so-and-so, don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. You came to Christ because of him. He drew you. You didn't do anybody a favor. Boast in God is the one who makes the difference. So your faith will rest in Him and in His power. It's you, Lord. That's what this is all about today. It's not about you, it's always about Him. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in Him. I'm nothing, I'm nothing without Him. Jesus even echoed those, those very sentiments. I do nothing but what the Father tells me to do. If Jesus said that, how much more we should say that? You see, 
our pride and our ego is strong and deceptive. So I sat there a few weeks ago feeling miserable. Why? Because a part of me said I should be better than this. Part of me said I should be above this. Part of me said I shouldn't, I shouldn't act like this. I'm the pastor. And God didn't kick me. He didn't kick me when I was down. I imagine he probably laughed. Tough lesson, huh, John? Guess what? It's not about you. I'm going to show you I love you. I'm going to give you a day that's going to bless your socks off. And you're going to realize it was never about you. It's always been about me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. And we're going to end with this. John, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Second Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Go ahead, bro, if you got it. To keep me from, from becoming conceited because of surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. He said to you, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Let me just pause here a second. Paul has had amazing visions from God. He talked about being taken up into the third heaven, whatever that is. But God gave him these incredible revelations. I think a lot of them we don't know. I don't think they were ever written down, honestly. But he had these amazing things God showed him. And he said, to keep me from becoming conceited. We all know what conceit is, right? I'm better than everybody else. What a temptation it must have been for him. God's giving these incredible revelations of the third heaven, whatever that is. It would be so easy, right, to fall in that deception of, wow, look at me. Hey, God's speaking to me these incredible things, you know. But he, he recognized God sent this messenger. We don't know exactly what it is. He says it, it was a thorn in his flesh. Some, some theories are he had really bad eyesight. Some say you know, he was physically rather frail kind of a guy and, and you know, wasn't much to look at. I, I don't know. I, we really don't know exactly what it is. But he recognized, you know, he asked God, first of all, God, would you please take it from me three times? And finally God said, no, I'm not taking this from you because in my weakness you're going to continue to be strong. It's not about you, Paul. It's about me. Therefore, when there's a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. See, that's not American. Americans are strong, independent. We don't need anybody. The Lord says it's better to boast about your weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Because if I think I can do it, then he'll let me do it. <laughs> And I'll fall flat on my face. If I realize, you know, God, I'm weak without you. I can do nothing. Then I'm going to rest in his power. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. And in insults. Hardships. Persecutions. And difficulties. Why? Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. It's God's economy can't explain it to you other than this compared to God you and I have no strength anyway we are completely weak helpless hopeless apart from him we can't do anything in him what does the scripture say all things are possible I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me nothing shall be impossible to those who believe Amen? So God takes us who we are, the mess that we are, and says, I'm going to use you because it's never been about you. It's always been about me. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon you and through you to accomplish things you could never hope to accomplish 
on your own. I was downstairs yesterday looking at the downstairs. Russ and I were talking about some things down there and we get, get, got some work done. And I, 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 it hit me again. You know, God, I have no real idea why you want us to do this downstairs. Why, why do you want this here? But I can't get away from the fact God telling me, no, you don't. Not yet, but I'm going to blow your mind. It's not going to be what you think. It's going to be incredible because I'm in it. It's got nothing to do with you. Stay out of the way. Do what I tell you, and I'm going to do great and mighty things.